Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so, uh, so welcome everyone. So uh, uh, we are here today uh, to to really discuss the findings of uh, the research that we have done uh, as a part of a state of governance uh, uh, report, uh, which is uh, focusing on uh, governance issues around COVID in Bangladesh uh, to really try and understand the realities and the reflections to build forward better. Now, uh, I just want to, you know, before we start off, just to let you know that uh, for BIGD, uh, I mean, the state of governance report itself has been uh, going on. I mean, we started in 2006. This is actually the 15th year of state of governance. And uh, Naomi and Mirza Bhai both have been part of uh, 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 the state of governance, uh, the first state of governance, and Mirza Bhai since then uh, has continued. So in many ways, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a reunion in, 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 in many ways as well. So over the last 15 years, we have had uh, 10 uh, state of governance reports, and this is the 11th uh, state of governance report. Um, the purpose of state of governance uh, work that we do is, uh, is on the one hand to provide a a sector of a kind of a thematic we pick up a theme and look at uh, look at the state of the sector from a, from a governance uh, angle but it it is beyond uh, just a description uh, or a descriptive work around looking at the state of uh, of a particular theme uh, from a governance angle it is also the purpose is also to uh, to provide framework new ways of conceptualizing frameworking and providing new language to really understand our current realities as well, so that we can also think about the future in a more forward-looking way and a more constructive way. So in, in some ways, in a modest way, this, this state of governance is also trying to, uh, pro, uh, trying to perform a discourse setting role as well uh, uh, in terms of governance research. Uh, so I, I, uh, I think this particular, uh, I think the first one we did clearly, you know, did that in 2006, knowledge, perception, and reality. Um, uh, and I think uh, we have done a couple which also does that uh, uh, in, in various ways. But I think this one in particular has been a really, uh, uh, I think, one where we, we think, uh, you know, we, we are uh, trying to come up not only in terms of understanding reality or describing reality, but, but also uh, trying to provide a framework uh, uh, to really understand where we are and how do we move move uh, move forward. Uh, so, so with that, I would like to uh, invite today's uh, uh, presenters. Uh, we have two presentations: one from uh, Dr. Mirza Hassan uh, and uh, Dr. Naomi Hussain. Uh, uh, they would provide uh, the first presentation, and then Professor Asar Usmani would provide uh, the second presentation, and then we'll move into uh, comments uh, from our distinguished discussants. Uh, so. Uh, 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 Mirza Bhai and Naomi, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imran. Um, and thank you uh, to all the participants and, and in particular our distinguished uh, discussants because I'm looking forward to a very good discussion and perhaps even arriving at some action points at the end of, of these two hours. Um, it's also a very a, a great pleasure to uh, for the Accountability Research Centre to be able to partner with the Brack Institute of governance and development um, on this really important, very timely, and hopefully um, very useful uh, report on the state of governance of COVID. Um, and I should say one, one or two things about this report and the process of the report before we get started, really, which is to say that this is a moving target. You know, we're, we're, we're talking about the state of governance of COVID as though, as though, it's, as though we know everything, as though it's finished. It's not finished, we're very much in the middle of it. And what we have tried to do in this report is to take stock of uh, the governance and the politics of the management of COVID in the first year in Bangladesh, uh, with, as, as Imran very usefully pointed out, an eye to figuring out how to respond in the short term, right now, when it's really urgent, but also building institutions that we have called anti-fragile institutions. We think Bangladesh needs um, the kinds of governance, the kinds of governance institutions that actually get stronger each time they face a shock, because Bangladesh and many other countries, but Bangladesh in particular, is likely to face multiple shocks in the future. Um, I should say we also have a really excellent and large team of researchers and two star uh, contributors to the report, Professor Osmani and Dr. Shahadu Zaman, 
it's been an enormous pleasure and we feel very privileged to have been able to bring this work together. And um, one very last thing about this is that COVID-19 has affected all of us personally. We've all lost people. We've all uh, been close to people who have lost people. And for us, this report is not just putting together facts and figures to document. This is very much in our view, an exercise in accountability. We are asking questions here. What went right? What went wrong? And what have we learned? So let's hope that I'm now able to shift my slides. This is the outline of the report. These are the topics we will be covering, the why governance matters, the political economy of the pandemic, including information from a survey undertaken in January 2021, which feels like ancient history now, another, another period in the pandemic in Bangladesh. We'll look at the health sector, the lockdown and the relief programs. Professor Osmani will talk in more detail about the economic stimulus package. We have a, a really fascinating um, and slightly disturbing analysis of that. We'll also talk about the impact on the RMG sector, the ready-made garment sector, and there will also be, um, I, won't, I won't talk very much about the urban governance from below work, but I strongly encourage you to read um, the really excellent chapter in the report, which details the, the lives of people in informal uh, urban set settlements during uh, COVID and how they adapted. And then we'll finish with some recommendations. Mirzapai and I will split this up, hopefully, internet gods willing. Um, Imran has already explained uh, the state of governance and uh, why we decided to focus on COVID-19. Um, as I said, this is a, it's a moving target. We don't think of this as a final analysis, but an intervention we hope timely and useful in two debates about what's working and why it's working. Um, these, uh, the, a pandemic of this scale and nature is particularly problematic, particularly dangerous for a country like Bangladesh, which has um, very weak um, public health system, as well as um, uh, a, a very large uh, proportion of the population living really quite close to the poverty line or, or below it in many cases as well. So these are really urgent questions that we wanted to address. Um, it's, it's, it's very clear that governance matters for how well governments have managed COVID, but it's not exactly clear why or how, you know, the magic that goes on in a country that's well governed, why some countries that are democratic have been able to uh, manage uh, COVID quite well, and some authoritarian governments have also managed to, uh, to govern uh, COVID reasonably well, uh, and, and the, the multiple uh, examples in between that. Um, there's no there's no clear answer to whether to what kind of what kind of political regime has 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 been most successful, but we do know um, that quite, that matters like trust and state capacity have mattered a great deal. Governments citizens need to be able to trust their state, and the state needs to be able to do what they say they're going to do, or people do lose trust, and those are the situations in which the management of governance is um, and the management of COVID is is deeply problematic. Really important reason why governance matters for managing COVID-19 is a really crucial issue for us today is that this clearly endangers Bangladesh's development achievements, uh, poverty uh, reduction, hunger reduction, um, and all the, the domains. I mean, if you think about the children who haven't been in school for, what is it now, 16 months? Uh, in, you know, a whole generation lost, um, you know, a whole year and a half of learning so far, and this is a an education crisis, a learning crisis for sure for Bangladesh. We, need, we, we don't in fact deal with education in this report, but this is definitely something that needs to be taken up. I'm going to hand over to Mirzabhai for this part. You will have to you unmute. Uh, yes, yes, I did, I did. And you know, I'm having a problem with my internet, very unstable. So if I sometimes you know, disappear, you can continue, okay? All right. Um, uh, so, the, in terms of its state capacity, I, we thought that you know um, uh, the, the, uh, the one of the most important variable would be the state capacity and also the political commitment that has kind of uh, determined uh, the response of the of the state in terms of COVID nineteen. <clears throat> and what when we talk, uh, what do we mean by state capacity? Essentially, different components: bureaucratic capacity, fiscal capacity trust and legitimacy that the state 
enjoys. That also part of the capacity. Infrastructural power capacity, meaning the, the reach of the state in terms of bureaucratic reach uh, at, at the grassroots, uh, in terms of delivering services. And uh, finally, political capacity uh, to uh, political coordination of the entire intervention and so on. And by a political commitment, uh, that would be the autonomy of the top leadership in terms of you know, overriding the, the veto powers of different powerful constituency. Um, and uh, uh, also, I would add, um, uh, the political elites uh, propensity to uh, manage this kind of crisis, uh, crisis on a non-ideological basis, meaning you know, political elites not being um, uh, uh, amenable to or catering the needs of some ideological constituency, whether it is Hindutva, anti-science, anti-vax, and so on. Those are more ideological. And, and political elites uh, uh, essentially behaving in a rational, scientific manner. And I, fortunately, I would argue that we have that kind of political elites for varieties of reasons. Um, and in terms of concentration of political power, uh, what is important uh, for us to know that you know, we have a dominant party state, no viable uh, political rivals at this moment. Uh, and then uh, governments, uh, 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 reliance on performance legitimacy, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, enforcement of power, uh, that's a bit problematic in Bangladesh. Uh, this crisis and in the past several crises and several issues of, you know, of a highly transformative nature have shown that um, uh, our societal power, society is much more powerful than the state. And uh, if you look at the most recent lockdown, I mean, as we talk, we are going through a lockdown here. You can see the, the weakness of the state. So, so that's something you know, that has been, uh, we, we, uh, we are living with it for a, for a very, very long time, that state being weaker than the societal actors. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, uh, this is something to do with the legitimacy in general. And um, uh, we have done um, several surveys, uh, 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 broader surveys uh, 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 other than COVID related uh, about the trying to understand citizens' uh, view of the state um, uh, back in 2019. Before that, Asia Foundation uh, uh, has been uh, conducting surveys in the 15th and 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. The, the, the overall, uh, the finding is that citizens in Bangladesh trying to trust the government on broader meta issues in terms of you know, political, in, in terms of economic order, in terms of social order, but political order, it is declining the legitimacy over time, but not a lot as one would expect, normatively speaking, um, but uh, it's still there. And in terms of uh, COVID management, we have seen you know, quite a high uh, degree of legitimacy, legitimacy of the state in terms of you know, performance in uh, managing COVID. Although um, uh, the, uh, when it comes to specific issues uh, uh, like you know, public health messaging, like you know, uh, testing uh, 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 and, and, and the information that's been given by the, by this, by the government in terms of death and infection uh, statistics, people tend not to uh, trust the government. So the legitimacy in terms of specifics are very low. Um, also in terms of lockdown, as we'll discuss later, in terms of in you know, a design of the lockdown, implementation of the lockdown, citizens are fairly uh, critical. Uh, and um, one of the reasons was that, you know, in, in the lockdown design, uh, the, the question of livelihood was not taken very seriously by the government. That's one of the major reasons. Um, and uh, in, uh, in terms of you know, health sector governance, as you can see in the slide, um, uh, the, uh, there's a lack of policy framework um, and infrastructure not so robust uh, uh, in, in terms of pandemic response, uh, a grossly under-resourced health system, uh, public mess uh, messaging was not very effective, as I said earlier, less trust uh, by the citizen. Uh, and, and, and the governance was very centralized, uncoordinated, non-transparent, and, and the public procurement uh, was slow 
an LGBT product. Um, but now the question is um, whether the elites in Bangladesh, political, social, economic elites who suffered a lot and still suffering in terms of uh, first class health services, will this, this dismal picture, dismal performance, will uh, incentivize them to, to demand for high quality health services or not? I remember Professor Suman was talking last year in an in a interview somewhere in the media that we need a, a CMH. Why there should be one CMH? There should be several CMH. The one wonders you know, whether the elite will demand that, you know, the multiple CMH in Bangladesh, dozens of CMH in Bangladesh of that standard. Move on. Next slide, please. And as you can see here, um, in terms of you know, testing rates, uh, Bangladesh has the, has the lowest to, to other comparator countries. And one, uh, one uh, wonders, uh, is that deliberate? to, to, to uh, create a, some kind of you know, uh, positive image of the state that you know, we, we, we didn't suffer much, you know, we didn't have, the government could effectively control the infection and so on. Was it deliberately done? And uh, um, uh, yeah, I mean, just one point over there. Uh, uh, this is not a you know, speculation. This is not a you know, conspiracy theory that I'm talking about. Uh, at one point in June, 2020, one of the government officials was quoted saying, that we need to stop testing to avoid unnecessary tests and ensure better management. So I leave it to the audience to interpret these kind of comments. Um, the governance of lockdown, um, Bangladesh people, as we discussed earlier, that they really wanted some kind of, you know, they were afraid of virus, they wanted some kind of lockdown, um, and they welcomed it at the beginning and, and they dutifully followed it. They were compliant in, at the, in the 2020s. But in general, you know, the governance wasn't good. The communication wasn't good. It wasn't called lockdown. It was called holiday, these and that, lots of change, confusion, inconsistent messaging, and so on. Uh, so that created a problem. Um, and the st strong public consensus, still there is a consensus, is that that lockdown would be viable if it can you know, somehow, you know, balance with good relief provisioning, meaning, you know, the livelihood is taken very seriously. And uh, as we know, I mean, um, uh, there was a, uh, what we call forbearance, ignoring the, uh, the breakdown, the, the breaking of rules by the army, police, officials, you know, and, and they, they, they knew, I mean, if you can't afford, if you can't deliver food to the poor people, how, how, should, how can we, you know, enforce something very strictly? Um, in 2021, apparently the government has, seems to have learned something they're calling lockdown as lockdown. There's some co better coordination, and so on. And uh, yeah, those kind of, you know, there are some, some lessons learned, it, it apparently looks like. Move on, please. Uh, the governance of the relief program, um, it was a major initiative, of course, uh, uh, but the information about entitlements was very limited and beneficiary selection and delivery process were opaque and unaccountable. If you go to the next slide, we'll see that. Um, the integrity. Serious questioning of the integrity of the entire process. Look at 67 plus 11 percent people thought, you know, it was corrupt, the process. There was nepotism and so on. A beneficial list was not taken very seriously. And the one um, uh, interesting fact that, you know, we expected NGOs to come forward to do a lot, but they couldn't apparently. I mean, according to the perception of the citizen, only 12 percent citizen uh, uh, told us that, you know, the NGOs could help them. They were, NGOs were visible doing that. Okay, move on, please. Um, on the impact on the RNG sector, uh, one is, of course, you know, economists talks about that all the time, that, you know, the high, high dependency in one sector. But in general, what we found out through this crisis is that, you know, international brands treated Bangladeshi workers as disposable, clearly. Um, and factory owners benefited from rapid stimulus package in theory to pay workers wages. And we can discuss this further later, move on. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of you know, directives and public health provisions for RNG workers were very unclear, inadequate and unenforced. And in general, it laid bare the, vulnerabil the vulnerabilities of workers that lack voice and organizational strength, clearly uh, Kalpan Akhtar is here who can talk about it a lot, that um, unfortunately our workers are not that organized to fight back as the effective countervailing power. 
And that explains a lot what happened in that sector. Uh, I would ask, uh, request Naomi to move, to take over from now on. Could I just, uh, five more minutes, please? Thanks, Imran. It'll be, it'll be about five minutes, Max. Um, so I, 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 I said to you already a little bit about this piece. I urge you to look, uh, to read the chapter in the, in the full report, um, which has a really interesting account of how communities, and I think this is very emblematic of, of what we know about, um, about uh, Bangladeshi resilience, is that there was you know, a sense that the state had abandoned them and they established a whole regime of rules and practices to uh, protect their local community. Um, a really remarkable um, example of adaptation in the, in the local, government, local government space. Um, uh, we can't pin too, man too many of our hopes on multiple communities coping by themselves, but nevertheless, it's, it's heartening. Um, uh, what's going on here, sorry. So I'm going to go through our recommendations, which we have grouped into three areas. The first is that we should build on our strengths. Bangladesh has a number of strengths. Bangladesh's governance and administration and general national apparatus has a number of strengths that we can build on to uh, mount a more effective COVID response. The first is Bangladesh is so well known for its disaster management capacities. OK, this is not a flood or a cyclone, but we should be able we should have the kinds of skills, the kinds of resources and capacities within government to cope with a much broader range of potential shocks. Um, we, we don't know what they will look like. These are the, what do they call it? The, the known unknowns. Um, and uh, we don't know where they'll come from next. Will it be a financial crisis? Will it be a, an oil price crisis? What kind of crisis? We don't know. We know there will be more. So across government, we expect to see a much stronger disaster management capacities. This is really a critical juncture for Bangladesh in terms of social projection, in our opinion. It's really time to have a much broader, a much bolder vision of social protection, which is much more universal in nature if we don't want to undo decades of progress um, on human development. Um, and although I think the evidence that there is a great deal of corruption in social protection is actually quite limited, there, it is clear that there is a, lot, a lack of trust in the, in the system of social protection. It must be more accountable. We must have functioning grievance redress mechanisms. We must have much more transparency. And a very good way of doing that, of course, is to make social protection much more universal. A second uh, part of the building on, 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 our, uh, on our strengths is that we have this immensely rich social capital in Bangladesh. <clears throat> we have experts in all kinds of relevant areas to managing pandemic. And yet a lot of our social capital assets were not drawn on, were not leveraged by the government. Government silenced critics, silenced um, alternative uh, perspectives on, on COVID and, and could really have uh, mounted much more effective partnerships with community-based organizations, NGOs, civil society groups, professional associations. But actually policy making, particularly in the health sector, turned out to be highly centralized and exclusionary, bureaucratic and not very effective. Um, we think it's very clear that the government needs to accept that scrutiny and criticism are how you improve. If, you're, if your legitimacy as a government depends on performing for the people, you need to improve your performance all the time. We must have space for civic groups and experts to feed into policy making. And then there are the enormous gaps that we have yet to plug. And I don't really want to say much about health at this stage because I think this this in itself could be the subject of you know, 50 reports quite usefully. There's so much to be said about the, the weaknesses, the chronic and fatal weaknesses of the Bangladesh health system. Uh, and, and none of these will be achieved through uh, privatization. We're talking about public health measures, uh, unavoidably so. There's so much to be done. Um, in the short term, obviously we recommend prioritizing uh, vaccines, test and containment, um, systems and also I think there's some excellent work going on uh, with BRAC and others around uh, mask mask use and I think this is you know as as, as uh, Mirzabai said you know our citizens are smart enough to know and our politicians are not stupid enough to politicize issues like mask wearing like they do in uh, down the street from where I live here in Washington DC. Um, there is a whole area, and I'll leave it to Professor Osmani to detail this further, but economic policies must be for the people. 
not for GDP growth. You cannot eat GDP growth. So we have to make sure that stakeholders have space to, to establish proper principles and practices for economic stimulus packages in the future. I'm hoping Professor Osmani will take this up. And now I'm handing this back. Well, last one, Mirzabai. Can you come back for this one? This is uh, Mirzabai's favorite recommendation. Um, well, um, okay. Well, anti-fragile, we, we have already defined it. It's like, you know, when, uh, when something, when state or whatever system gains from disorder and, you know, become, more, uh, become stronger. So we need that kind of, you know, anti-fragility embedded in, uh, in our system, in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the state system, in the public policy system, in the implementation process system, in the policy making, monitoring and feedback, which means bringing in organized citizens somehow greater synergy between the state and the community in a meaningful sense, not in a, in a token sense. Okay, so em embedding that, that's very important. Local governments, independent agencies, ministries, I mean, they need to operate flexibly. flexibly. Uh, the old bureaucratic system, the, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the liturgy, the, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, procedures and rules, regulation, they have to be very flexible. So, so the local government in a particular, say in a particular district, even in a particular Upazila, can uh, flexibly change, customize their you know, service delivery process based on the local needs and in, in uh, getting feedback from the community. And, and, and that uh, feedback uh, uh, should be functional. Uh, uh, we are talking about adaptive governance, quick learning, uh, flexibility in authority, Politicians at the same time uh, being very informed, so can then work, you know, in, 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 uh, in uh, cooperatively with the with the bureaucracy and the community and so, so on. Um, Thanks, Mr. Pai. Okay. This is what we're after: anti-fragile institutions of governance. Um, I just want to um, finish by making sure all of the research team are um, are known to you. Um, this is the full team. And in, in addition, we've had a lot of help from Nusrat Jahan and Zareen, who's organized this webinar. Thank you all so very much. It was a mammoth task. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And, uh, and there you have it. Handing over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naomi. Uh, just uh, I, I suddenly realized that I, I did not uh, introduce the two speakers. So uh, Dr. Mirza Hassan is a senior research fellow and the head of the governance and politics cluster of BIGD Brack University. And Dr. Naomi Hussain is a research professor at Accountability Research Center, American University. Great, so uh, let's now move to the second presentation uh, uh, by Professor Esar Osmani. He's a professor of development economics at Ulster University and also a visiting professor at Brack University. Sir, can I uh, really urge you to finish in by, by eight o'clock, please? Thank you so much, by, and in half an hour's time, thank you. Good guy, I've unmuted myself. Thank you, Imran, and thank everybody else. And um, <clears throat> I'm very happy to be, first of all, to have been a part of the team that produced this excellent report and, of course, still working on it. This is the first time I've been associated with the State of Governance report. And it was a great pleasure working with the team led by uh, Mirza Hassan and Naomi. For both of whom I have great respect. And the, I, have, I should um, add, by, add that um, the chapter on which I'm going to speak was co-authored by myself and Dr. Shahada Siddiqui of Department of Economics, Dhaka University. So he's not present here today. I, I don't know whether he's among the audience, but certainly not among the speakers. But anything that I'm saying is actually a joint uh, responsibility of both Dr. Siddiqui and myself. What, I, what we have tried to do in this chapter is to analyze the government stimulus, so-called stimulus package in terms of some of its characteristics. What exactly were those packages trying to achieve and what they did achieve and what they failed to achieve? In doing this analysis, we came to the conclusion that government made some choices. 
about what kind of package it would offer. And then you try to explain the underlying logic of those choices in political economy terms. In particular, in terms of what, in our view, drives the government's quest for political legitimacy. So we start with factual analysis of the stimulus package, draw some conclusions about the characteristics, leading to some conclusion about choices made by the government, and then explain the choices in political economy terms. That's the strategy of this exercise. It's, a, it's an incomplete uh, presentation in terms of uh, slides that I'm going to show, but I shall supplement it with my remarks, particularly towards the very end. I'm handling this presentation myself. Is it visible? Thank you. Yes, sir, it is. It is visible. Could you, sir, perhaps try to go on the presentation mode? It may just be better if it is possible, sir. It should be. Thank you. Yeah, okay. It's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So the title of this, it's a, of course a working title, Economic Support in Response to COVID-19 and the Quest for Political Legitimacy. First of all, some broad figures. The official estimate as of January 2021 of the amount of support provided through these packages was 4.4% <clears throat> of GDP. Actually, some of the elements of these packages cannot be directly attributed to uh, COVID-19 in address. They are going to be undertaken in any case. If we exclude them, then the adjusted figure turns out to be 3.96, almost 4%. So it's still apparently quite a substantial and quite a impressive in terms of size, the overall package. The problem, however, is partly that in spite of the size of promise, the actual implementation was much less. By October 2020, the allocation, the utilization was only 44% by according to government's own estimates. So less than half of the promised packages were implemented uh, within first five months of, of the onset of the crisis. The other thing we need to note is where did the support come from? Where did the resource come from? In popular discussion, it sometimes appears, often appears, that the government is actually providing the support from its budgetary resources. That is not the case. There are three sources of financing this package. One is, of course, government budget, the fiscal support. The other is refinancing by the Bangladesh Bank. And the third is activation of idle balances in the banking sector. Now, refinancing by the Bangladesh Bank amounts to new money creation by creating what we call high-powered money. An activation of idle money balance, balances in the banking sector also tend to amounts to new money creation by strengthening the money multiplier. So essentially, there is fiscal support and there is new money creation. And of these two, our analysis shows the fiscal support amounted to no more than half percent of GDP. And the rest came from new money creation of one type or another. So when government says, we have, we have been committing so much resources as a poor country, how, how can you do more? Take that with a grain of salt. Budgetary resource commitment, only less than half percent of GDP, whereas the total commitment is 4% of GDP. The other feature we need to take note is the nature of the support programs. We divided the support programs into two broad categories called protection-oriented and growth-oriented. 
programs that intervene directly to protect the poor households and individuals faced with the threat of hunger, we call them protection oriented. And programs whose proximate impact would be on the revival of economic growth through enterprise support, we call growth oriented. Of course, in this orientation, any impact, it could eventually have impact on the individuals and households too, through growth, but that's an indirect effect. So the direct support to the poor households in danger of hunger, we call protection oriented and the enterprise support we call growth oriented. And I have some lists here I'm not going to show now, but this is the interesting figure here. The protection oriented programs accounted for just one fifth of total support, 20%. Lion's share, 80%, went to growth oriented packages. In terms of GDP, percent of GDP, growth oriented packages accounted for 3.16% of GDP, and protection oriented ones accounted for only 0.8% of GDP. And even the even when you look at the growth oriented packages and note that yes, some of the growth oriented support will eventually seep into, uh, percolate into benefit for the individuals and households who will be engaged on those enterprises. You would think that if you really want to support the poor people, then the growth oriented support should go to the small scale enterprises, cottage enterprises, because that's where most of the poor people are engaged. But even there, you find that even the growth oriented package had a large enterprise bias. In terms of share of allocation, two thirds, 68% went to large enterprises and only 27% went to small enterprises. In terms of utilization, percentage of fund utilized, 78% went to large enterprises and only 16.5% to small enterprises. And this is uh, an estimate that is for late January 2021, by that time. So you see, <coughs> overall, this entire policy package was not biased towards the poor. It was, it was not biased to those who are faced with serious threat of hunger and deprivation as a consequence of losing their livelihoods in the wake of the lockdown. Yet, in its evaluation of the programs, the Ministry of Finance in, in, a, in the evaluation has claimed, the marginalized people in the country did not face any shortage of food because of the cash and food aid provided under the stimulus scheme. The possibility that these people would slide below the poverty line once again has also been reduced. The structure of stimulus packages that I have just given you the indication does not suggest that this conclusion can be supported. In fact, actual evidence of how the poor people have fared does not support this conclusion either. I'll give you, most of you will be familiar with this, but I'm going to summarize some of the findings. The BIGD PPRC study of June to July, June 20 to July 2, they found that more than 60% of the poor and low income population who suffered income losses because of lockdown did not receive any support from public or private sector. About 40% of households got some assistance but that amounted to only 4% of their lost income. In an earlier survey, the same institutions found that households had lost 80% of their income. If they had lost 80% of their income and regained only 4% because of the support, the bulk of what they had lost had not been recovered. How could they have not suffered from food shortage and other deprivations? And then there's a subsequent study later on. So the earlier study was June, July, but the next study was uh, 
oh, sorry, we are still concerned with that particular study. And it is found that it's not that the direct support was missing, the indirect support through growth revival was not much help either. How do you know that? In the immediate aftermath of the lockdown, the proportion of crisis caused new poor was about 23%. The resumption of economic activities reduced that proportion to just about one percentage point. So the direct, so the indirect support through growth revival did not help either. So these are the findings immediately for, after two or three months after the packages were introduced. What happened afterwards, after six months? Sanem study, which was undertaken in six months after the initial package was introduced, found that at that time, even after six months, rate of poverty was as high as 42% against the benchmark of 21% a couple of years ago. So even after six months, poverty had not gone down. So the conclusion of this structure of stimulus packages. While direct food and cash support was wholly inadequate, the strategy of helping the poor indirectly through livelihood restoration, that is growth revival, did not work either. And this conclusion is supported yet by yet another study, CPD Oxfam study, which showed the government stimulus package reached a mere 8% of total employment so indirect support through growth revival, through enterprise support did not work either. So in sum, the emphasis, clear emphasis in this package was growth, growth, and growth, not support for the individuals and households who were in danger of hunger and other forms of deprivation. Why did the government choose this option? That's where the political economic considerations come in. Government made a choice, in our, in our view, to go for growth, ignoring, I said not ignoring, but I qualify that remark, it did not entirely ignore, but they gave lower priority to the welfare of the poor households and individuals. You see, if you look at the quest for legitimacy of the government on Bangladesh, Naomi has written brilliantly on this topic and I have learned a lot from her work and Ms. Hassan's work, that one of the pillars of governance in our country for a long time has been that whatever you do, government from government point of view, whatever you do, you must not allow a severe mortality crisis that has started from the British days, continued to Pakistan days, and avoidance of a serious mortality crisis has been one of the fundamental principles of governance in this country and one of the pillars of legitimacy. Governments realize that if they allow severe mortality to emerge, crisis to emerge, it will lose legit political legitimacy in the country. But this is true for all governments of all hues. So why does a particular government in power try to do? In addition to this traditional legitimacy, they need to seek for some additional source of legitimacy so that it can outsell in political field by competing with the political rivals. Now, some governments whom we know about have sought this additional legitimacy by invoking religion. We are more Islam person than others. That has been the line of some political parties. Now for the current political government, our belief, that particular line of legitimacy would be hard to proclaim explicitly in view of the seed of secularism that has been embedded in our constitution by the father of the nation, the leader of 
prime leader of Aung Lee. So this religion-based legitimacy was not available to this government. This government chose the additional legitimacy through the creed of growth, that we are able to deliver growth better than anybody else. So the political legitimacy of the current government is based on twin pillars of legitimacy. One is avoidance of mortality crisis, which is the traditional one, plus the proclaimed ability, superior ability to deliver growth compared to political rights. These are the twin pillars of their legitimacy. Now, when the, lock, when the Christ, COVID crisis came, and the country went into lockdown, both these pillars of legitimacy were in danger of collapsing. Lockdown meant stoppage of economic activity. So the growth foundation of the legitimacy was in danger. Lockdown meant loss of livelihoods of the people. And that threatened hunger and mortality crisis. So that both, both pillars of legitimacy were in danger. Government had to make a choice, either trying to hold both pillars or accept one pillar and give up the other one. In the end, of course, they chose the growth legitimacy. Why did they do so? Why didn't they care for the, mortal, the other legitimacy crowd, the mortality? And this is where this story becomes interesting. I present here a picture of at what stage of the crisis government began to reopen the economy for revival of economic growth? Remember, this revival scheme, the, the COVID restrictions came in March, end of March. Almost after one month, April, end of April, the garment sector began to be opened up and there were all uh, indications that many other sectors will be opened up. By the middle of May, in practice, most of the things had been opened up. And by the end of May, on paper also, almost everything was opened up. So economy was opened up at a time when according to this figure, government figure by the way, Positivity rate of infection was climbing. This is end of May. This is, this is the end of April when the initial openings were done. End of May, all the openings were completed and the positivity rate is still rising and it was around 20%. WHO, all other health experts would, would tell you that any positivity rate above 5% is dangerous. Be cautious. But even when the positivity rate was around 20%, and rising, government opened up the economy. In doing so, they encountered the danger that serious mortality crisis was, would emerge because of hunger. Now, and you see the cumulative positivity rate at that time in Bangladesh was the highest among our neighboring countries, 20% here and much less elsewhere. Why? Did they not realize? Why didn't they realize that is, is a, it would be now, if not hunger, it would be a mortality crisis through COVID death? There was a serious danger that was happening. As it turned out, that COVID induced health mortality crisis did not happen. The cumulative fatality rate in Bangladesh was one of the lowest compared to other developing countries, which remains a paradox. The cumulative positivity rate is one of the highest, but the fatality rate was one of the lowest. I don't have an explanation for that, and I haven't seen an explanation from that from anybody. Why is it that we, among the developing countries, I'm not comparing developed with developing, which is if you compare them, you can't compare because age compositions and other things differ. But within the developing countries, we had one of the highest positivity rates. How come we had the lowest mortality rate? 
I don't know the answer and I haven't seen the answer. However, on paper, on record, it is true that Bangladesh did have one of the lowest fatality rates. That gave the government the ground to believe, rightly or wrongly, that if we open up the economy in quest of growth, we will avoid serious mortality crisis because of COVID. Shall we face mortality crisis out of hunger? Their hope was, as the economy revives, livelihood revives, people may not fully recover their income, but a serious subsistence mortality crisis might also be avoided. And by all accounts, subsistence mortality crisis was also avoided, serious. Of course, some people died, but there was neither a serious health mortality crisis nor a serious subsistence mortality crisis. Therefore, government decided that we can safely go for the growth option because that's where our real legitimacy lies. In the previous year, 18, 2018, 19, government had achieved the cherished goal of 8% growth of GDP for the first time. And they were very proud of it naturally. COVID, the th in the th fourth quarter of, 20, of 1920, it made it impossible to repeat that feat. But government was determined not to allow the failure to happen twice. Nothing could be done about 1920. 1920, but they would not allow growth rate to go down below 8% next year or the year after. So they went on for eight for growth. So my, our argument is that for, for some strange reasons, the health mortality crisis did not happen. And because of the resilience of our people, somehow they also avoided the subsistence mortality crisis government thought that one foundation of the legitimacy is secure. Therefore, they had to secure the other foundation of the legitimacy, the growth foundation, and which is what they went after. Interestingly, I'll, I'll finish in a couple of minutes. Just one, two things I want to add. This argument that I'm making that they went for the growth option whenever they realized that the mortality crisis was not going to happen because is indicated that there, there are some indications for that. And towards the end of April, just before they're opening the garments sector, day before that, the health minister announced, and it came in the newspaper, that we have one of the lowest death rates from COVID in the world. He was obviously preparing the ground for the subsequent reopening day economy. And, sorry, just, I'll just uh, read something. A few weeks later, a couple of three weeks later, the prime minister declared in the parliament, it came in the newspapers, we will not accept defeat. Death is inevitable and it can occur anytime, but it cannot happen that we will have to accept defeat to the invisible force out of fear. So she discounted death relatively speaking. And the only reason she could discount it, because by that time the government had convinced itself that the mortality crisis due to COVID was not going to be severe. That's why they chose that option. In doing so, they did avoid the crisis, mortality crisis, but they did not actually avoid crisis. There is still a serious subsistence crisis, not a mortality crisis, but a subsistence crisis. As you have seen, the poor people have suffered, and the poverty has not gone down significantly. Suffering has not gone down significantly. So there was a trade-off after all. The government's chosen strategy may have helped minimize the loss of growth, but it has done so by inflicting avoidable sufferings on a large segment of the population in terms of hunger and morbidity. Mortality may have been avoided. Still has been a serious price being paid in terms of persistent hunger and morbidity. 
my concluding remark in our concluding remark in the paper was I did it out one or two sentences that the government has been able to pursue this strategy without fear of losing its political legitimacy is presumably because endemic hunger and morbidity do not create a crisis of legitimacy in a way that large scale death does. We seem to live in a land where the voice of the dead is stronger than the voice of the living. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, I think uh, uh, as usual, I think uh, extremely thought provoking um, and I think insightful. And, and this is exactly the kind of uh, analysis, uh, you know, I think that should frame our conversations uh, 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 in this, in this, in this, in this uh, uh, webinar today. So uh, now let's move to, we've got uh, five uh, uh, discussants, uh, designated discussants, and each of them have been uh, uh, designated, if you like, a particular chapter. We have we have, we have shared uh, the draft report, the full draft report, which we'll finalize later. Uh, so let me uh, let me let me start uh, by inviting uh, uh, you know one by one. So first of all, let me go to uh, Dr. Ronak Jahan. Uh, Dr. Ronak Jahan is currently a distinguished fellow at the Center for Policy Dialogue and a political scientist, feminist leader, and author, visiting scholar at Columbia University, and has done extensive research focusing on issues of politics, governance, gender, development, and health. So Dr. Ronak Jahan will be, will be focusing her comments on our second chapter of the full-fledged report, which deals with governance of COVID-19 in Bangladesh, the political economy aspects of the pandemic management. Uh, Dr. Ronak Jahan, over to you. Uh, it'd be great if you could finish in maybe seven minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, and Imran, you can time me, for instance, uh, if I, yeah, before oh, one minute, uh, at the six minute. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate uh, uh, BIGD for an excellent report, because we have, for the, over the last 18 months, had many webinars and reports on COVID-19, which always referred to uh, governance uh, as and management as a key issue, but no report, uh, at least I have not seen a report which has focused uh, solely on governance of COVID. So I think I commend uh, um, you for preparing this uh, report. Also, I found the report to be very comprehensive and very well thought out uh, report. It starts with a theoretical framework uh, about how to measure governance. And then it uses that framework to assess a number of different aspects of governance, various sectors such as health, social protection, relief, economic stimulus, et cetera. And also interesting that there was an ethnographic study of one slum area, uh, Kurai, which I suppose can serve as uh, Brack's uh, Motlob uh, lab because it is so close to uh, 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 Brack, and you can actually do repeat surveys of, of uh, the same kinds of questions that you did uh, earlier. So, uh, so as Imran said and Mirza asked me to focus on chapter two. And uh, so I will uh, mainly uh, focus my comments on chapter two. And I would, uh, raise some very uh, three really uh, broad uh, questions. Uh, uh, but before that, let me say that I uh, found the theoretical framework that uh, Mirza has used uh, to be very useful. And in fact, this uh, uh, strong society, weak state framework he has used earlier also in some of his other studies. Here, apart from that particular framework, he has added uh, some criteria about how to assess uh, governance uh, performance and all these uh, various criteria that he has to uh, assess state capacity, governance capacity, I think is very useful. Uh, and I think other studies then can use this particular uh, framework. And I always uh, commend uh, Mirza because he always tries to at least put together a theoretical framework and just not describe uh, things. So 
that he is quite, uh, uh, I think he, perse he perseveres in uh, this uh, theoretic, um, trying to uh, develop an analytical framework. I want to raise um, basically three broad uh, questions. First, uh, Mirza, um, um, or particularly, I shouldn't say just Mirza, it is a joint report. The report uh, talks or uh, uses the concept of party dominant system. And it is true that we have now only one major single uh, party which is dominant. And then he uses this, or the report uses this interesting concept of uh, that because electoral legitimacy is low, so they are trying to uh, use performance legitimacy, which is an interesting hypothesis. Uh, because you know, if there is really no pressure and no opposition, the regime could have not even uh, focused on performance legitimacy. Suppose they don't perform, so what? There is no really real opposition. And there are examples, the report gives examples of Tanzania, where there is uh, no attempt uh, to even uh, focus on performance. And then I think uh, the report goes on to explain that why it is a party, that it is a party dominant state. And there is an incentive uh, for it to involve party leaders and party workers in policy making, policy implementation. But throughout this crisis, what we have heard is the ruling party leaders, ruling party workers have been complaining uh, quite publicly that they are nowhere involved either in policy making or in policy implementation. That it is the whole thing is being run as a bureaucratic show. That, uh, uh, that it is the bureaucrats who are making policies and they are implementing and they are not, the political actors are not um, getting uh, involved. Uh, uh, so, so I think here, I think the report really should look into this, that how, it, what is the role of bureaucracy and administration in, uh, governance and what is the role of political actors in governance uh, who really are getting more involved. But another pertinent question here, the, and I think it's a key question, is that is it really, I mean, should we be talking about a party rule or political party rule, or, or it is really a more of a personal, personal rule? Uh, and that it is really a personalized rule where the top leader really makes all the key decisions. And this is really nothing new. If we look at our 50 years of our uh, uh, history since uh, independence, then we find that no matter what the regime type is, whether parliamentary or presidential, whether ruled by military or ruled by political leaders, really, the system institutions are very factionalized and all decisions, uh, whether by design or by default, then has always been the, taken by one particular leader uh, and the top leader. Uh, so uh, then the question comes that what really is the role of political party or even a dominant political party in the uh, system. If the administration or management is done by bureaucrats, then what is the role of the political actors? Uh, is it their role to, and if their role is to just build some support, political support uh, through patronage, then if we want a more efficient 21st century type uh, administration, uh, then uh, these are two very conflictual kinds of a uh, situation. So I think one should really look at, just not that there is no opposition and one party, but really what role political actors and political leaders have played uh, throughout this crisis. And as I said, that they have been very publicly complaining 
that they have been left out of uh, playing a major role. Uh, then the second question I want to raise is about this whole notion of strong society. That what how the measures that are given of strong society is that of people do just what they feel like doing. They don't follow um, uh, lockdown rules, and then they uh, are, are doing their own uh, things. But here, I think we uh, should. I think another for any other later question, I think one should really uh, ask a question if you ever have another survey, that what is really people's expectation of, from the government? What role they really expect the government to play? If for decades, if they, their, their experience is that really they cannot depend too much on the government, that they are on their own. And as the Americans sort of are fond of saying that they want government, the only thing they want that the government shouldn't do anything, government should be off their back, let them manage their own affairs, that they would rather drown in the Mediterranean uh, uh, on a living. So I think this is, I think, is very important question to ask that what are citizens' expectations of government? That many things I think citizens know happening in terms of bad governance. The, one of the figures report shows is that over 60% of people knew that in terms of relief uh, distribution, um, that there was corruption. But you know, this is, people take it in their stride. They know that this happens. And so there is no better expectation of another uh, performance. So I think I, this, what is really uh, people's expectations now and, and where would the pressures come from? And then that is related to my final uh, point about the recommendation. Maybe yes. in a minute. Yeah, I am on my final point, and that is about the recommendations. All the recommendations are uh, 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 very good, and these are the recommendations almost all the studies on COVID has uh, have made about um, uh, creating institutions, um, then partnering with uh, other actors, uh, making it transparent. But again, my question is, what really is the incentive or pressure on the uh, state uh, to, uh, to follow any of these recommendations. As the survey itself, well, granted it was done before, but it shows either people are happy or accept this state of things. So if there is not a major unhappiness uh, and people are sort of think government uh, is doing a good job, and, and it is only maybe the chattering class who are unhappy, uh, then uh, they can go on doing whatever they have been uh, doing because I think they feel that they have a better sense on the pulse of the people than the, us academics and others. So I think this is also something we uh, need to uh, uh, keep in mind. And finally, uh, I think one interesting thing that I found is that in terms of asking or uh, going a bit deep into people's expectations from government, do people expect or are happy if there are bridges and uh, electricity, infrastructure, uh, flyovers, uh, that is a criteria of performance? Or do people really uh, care about uh, transparency or uh, uh, zero tolerance on, um, on corruption uh, or improved governance. So I think this is, I think, something that I think we need to explore a little bit more uh, before we make the same old uh, recommendations, because why would our recommendations be followed. These, many of these recommendations have been given over the last 18 months with very little uh, result. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jahan. I think uh, we, 
may try and come back towards the end uh, 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 from the authors getting some reactions to this, but I think your points around, you know, what are the mechanisms through which we're going to get to performance legitimacy and what are the mechanisms through which we're going to get to this 21st century statecraft that we really talk about, I think, I think is really at the crux. And I would be very interested to hear from the authors in terms of uh, uh, what their thinking is here. Uh, in terms of framing perhaps uh, uh, the next research, uh, uh, you know, kind of projects that we want to take on in this in this area. Great. Uh, now let's move. I mean, we are really, you know, short of time, but, uh, uh, you know, maybe we may need to extend uh, towards the end a bit more. Uh, let me apologize right at the beginning for that. Uh, uh, but I think this is such a rich uh, uh, conversation and rich group of people, I think, and, and, and a such important topic. Uh, and, and you know, I think I think it's important that uh, that that we do give people time. So let me now move to Dr. Murshida Choudhury. Uh, uh, Dr. Murshida Choudhury is a director of Health, Nutrition, and Population Program at BRAC, um, uh, and 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 she will be commenting on the State of Governance Chapter Four, which is on health sector governance, uh, uh, looking at capacity, preparedness, and response. Uh, Dr. Murshida, over to you. Thank you, Imran Sai. Um, I'm really honored and humbled to be part of this conversation. Mushira, um, I mean, we can't really hear you, man. Can you increase the volume somehow? Can you hear me now? Uh, maybe no. from my side. I don't know others. Can you hear me? Can no. others hear? No, it's I slightly. Very low. Yeah, it's better. It's speak. better now. Yeah. Why don't you? Why don't you? Why don't you continue, Mushira? Okay. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Um, the chapter four uh, is uh, talking about the, the governance uh, in health sector. So, um, I would start. Um, uh, yeah. This is uh, the start with congratulating the writers. This is really a very good analysis of what is going on and what is uh, uh, what has to be done. And uh, for, uh, compared to the context of the world, uh, this is a very good read uh, and, and, and a good um, example of uh, real-time analysis. And, and this is really, uh, this kind of uh, analysis is necessary for the policymakers um, and also uh, program managers as well. Because we always, uh, 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 are uh, suffering from some sort of complacency that, um, yeah, we are doing well uh, compared to others. Uh, but are we really doing well? The previous presentations showed that the actual, uh, actually what is happening uh, uh, is uh, not uh, the uh, picture uh, uh, that we, we see is uh, it's totally different, uh, the underlying picture. So, um, uh, you, ha you have started with the right thing that uh, uh, we, we always measure a health sector sector uh, strength with its either state's investment and our investment is very low and it uh, 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 considered to our neighboring countries uh, even the lowest and that that is why the out of pocket expenditure is like 74 percent that means um, uh, the all the people has to pay most of the uh, health expenditure uh, um, uh, of, from themselves. So that is uh, in, in current situation uh, when people are suffering from uh, COVID and the COVID uh, treatment itself is very expensive. You know that uh, if a person has to be hospitalized, it's a, a hundred thousand or more uh, uh, is needed. So uh, in such situation, how a person can uh, bear uh, that cost out of pocket when um, state can support um, them. And uh, we know that the uh, state uh, run hospitals uh, are running short of all sort of um, uh, support like beds, uh, ICUs and uh, of, uh, oxygen and, and, and even um, health human resource. Bangladesh is running short of health human resource, um, uh, which is uh, Lowest, lowest uh, like uh, second lowest in, in, in Southeast Asia, uh, six um, uh, um, uh, per 10,000, which should be 23, at least WHO, uh, uh, they, uh, according to WHO guidelines. So this uh, health human resource has to 
uh, deal with the, this uh, extra influx of um, uh, infect, um, COVID uh, cases uh, in hospitals and, uh, and, and, and obviously the other uh, healthcare has been hampered. And uh, that, that is, um, um, we can see in all other health indicators uh, that is going down. But, uh, I, but uh, why this is happening? Uh, we knew that this is going to happen, right? That uh, when uh, the COVID uh, first uh, detected uh, in, in China um, um, and, and all, uh, um, and the WHO uh, warned every, uh, all, every world to get prepared, and we had enough time and we declared that uh, our uh, uh, that we are ready but uh, when uh, we, are, we were hit right with covid we found that we are not really ready so um, and and the first wave was managed somehow but uh, that was something paradox that how we managed the first wave um, so there are there could be several um, uh, explanations testing, low testing, or, and the second could be, we are testing only the symptomatic cases. That means the symptomatic, if uh, we only identify the, sim, uh, test the symptomatic cases, then uh, the infection uh, rate will be higher, uh, but the death rate will be lower because the uh, case fatality uh, is uh, calculated, uh, the denominator is the number of positive cases. So the case detection will be depending on the number of case and the number of cases again depend on the number of tests we do. So the the uh, asymptomatic population is out of test. So uh, we don't know that how much how many asymptomatic uh, cases are in our community. So if they were in the community and uh, they were calculated the counted uh, the uh, fatality rate, we don't know that how much it would be. And uh, uh, the reporting um, again, we don't know um, uh, about the. Uh, what is happening in the rural area and people who are not showing up in the health facilities um, or uh, uh, are, are, are getting treated treated in the uh, private facilities so what is happening to them so i think uh, that is uh, uh, something um, uh, uh, is uh, uh, something uh, to look into that what is happening uh, to those kind of report uh, uh, and, and and that made uh, the uh, that is there is a chance of under reporting and lower and uh, less reporting um, uh, because uh, the report is coming from only government hospitals. And the other thing is uh, uh, that I, uh, it is discussed here that the countries are doing so which countries are doing better. Those countries have uh, 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 re responded very quickly, uh, and, th and those countries which have a good universal health coverage uh, 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 in their country. Uh, uh, there is a par uh, uh, opposite side as well. Uh, so we, and that was discussed also in the presentation as well. So um, it really, I think um, ma matters that how promptly a country takes decision is the, uh, is the, is the key. So uh, many of the times uh, we have uh, uh, dis taken the decision uh, pretty much late. Like uh, we, uh, we, we um, uh, if we talk about the uh, third, second or third wave, whatever we say, the, the current wave, um, uh, when we uh, found that the Delta is, uh, 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 has hit uh, India uh, and the, uh, the border has to be closed, uh, many of the like, public, public health experts uh, were uh, suggesting um, uh, 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 to different uh, media, we don't know whether they have a voice in the policy level or not, but in the media, they have uh, uh, they were urging to uh, close to shut the border. But the border was shut um, a couple of weeks after. So by that time, uh, the Delta, Delta entered uh, uh, in, in Bangladesh, and now we can see that uh, uh, cases almost every household. So um, I don't know this time how we are going to manage because uh, the first time the cases were only localized in um, uh, big big cities um, in Dhaka and Chittagong, but then, but this time it started from the rural areas and now uh, it's spreading to all the um, uh, 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 everywhere. So like it's almost everywhere. So this is going to be uh, like a test for us that how we do this time. Um, and uh, 
uh, one thing I, I'm going to uh, uh, also uh, 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 highlight here that the uh, um, uh, involvement of the uh, local government health authorities, you talked about local government, but I would, I'm talking about the local government health authorities decision making capacity, because um, we know that all uh, health um, after the first wave, all the health uh, civil health complexes were allocated certain amount of money, but only 15% of them could utilize that even the small amount of money. So they couldn't uh, utilize the small amount of money be because of uh, their, the fear of reporting, the fear of uh, getting involved into, into uh, corruption or uh, or, or something or or, or lack of uh, 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 leadership. So these uh, things are, is, is, is a matter of exercise. So these things are not exercised in our uh, regularly uh, in our uh, 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 local level. So everything, every decision uh, comes from the higher level. So there is the uh, culture of uh, getting command and doing and and doing the uh, and uh, obeying the command. So. Uh, locally, local level decision making is, is absolutely absent in the uh, in, in health system. But uh, a health manager at, at the every hospital should be a leader, and uh, he or she should know how to manage himself or herself, uh, his or her facility. So if that is not practiced, uh, so whatever beautiful system we develop, the health system is going to. Uh, 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 experience hiccups when we are or we um, are going to um, um, uh, uh, implement the, uh, some uh, quick decisions or this sort of uh, emergency uh, response uh, uh, action. Um, Ushlapa, can I mean, could you uh, just running really short of time? Is I mean, do you want maybe? Are, are you done or maybe you want just one more yeah well, yeah why did you finish up yeah sure yeah sure so i will i will uh, not talk about the other thing but the civil society and the, the private sector involvement in health sector uh, in any crisis i think is is crucial because it, uh, in bangladesh there is a, a very uh, a very uh, uh, good uh, example of the how uh, civil society um, uh, work uh, uh, closely with government in development. So in crisis situation, why uh, government hasn't called upon uh, civil society? It's a, uh, it's a really, um, um, I don't know, it's a question to me. And uh, if, even, if you can um, think uh, about the, uh, when the country response plan was developed, uh, at the time, um, no civil uh, society organization was uh, involved or uh, given any responsibilities. Even now, uh, many civil societies are doing on their own, but uh, th this is not streamlined or uh, there is no clear uh, uh, coordination from government to incorporate or include the private sector and civil society to fight COVID together. And I think that is the missing point and missing uh, um, uh, resources, missing, uh, 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 we are missing the opportunity here uh, to utilize all our resources together because COVID is something where be all society, all uh, country um, uh, response. So I think uh, I, I, will, I will stop here and yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Morshid. I think uh, the points you raise are, you know, are, are, are absolutely aligned with the way I think, uh, you know, we are approaching, uh, you know, this, this whole, this whole, this whole challenge. Uh, uh, so, so, so let's, let's, let's move on. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Binak Sen for his comments. Is Dr. Binak Sen is a director general of uh, the Bangladesh Institute of Development Studies, and he is going to be commenting on uh, chapter six of our draft report, and it is on achievements and challenges in the COVID-19 relief program. Uh, and you know, I think Binagda is a is a real expert in this area with long research in this in this space. So, Binagda, over to you. Thank you, Imran. Uh, Seven minutes, please, Binagda, if you can. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I will not make much comment on the relief chapter because I've gone through it quickly. I have more to say on other chapters. So chapter six has 
uh, I have three comments on that chapter. First, uh, the curious case of uh, creating poverty database uh, uh, that required resources of 732 crores or some something like that, and yet, yet it was not used by the government. Uh, it was mentioned in the chapter six, and it needs to be explored further because that would provide an instructive uh, lesson uh, for social protection programs. Second is that, that the chapter is based on limited perception survey. It needs to be grounded on more hard data investigating leakages in the relief system. Uh, the conclusions may be right, but the database is thin. And third point I have that it was mentioned and also highlighted in the introductory presentation that NGOs have been a weaker presence uh, during this period. So what was the reason and so on and so forth is a very intriguing case. I have some bit more to say on the overall characterization of the system. I think the we need to grow for a more nuanced theoretical framework. Uh, the framework that were that uh, recently provided by Partha Chatterjee uh, is, is called I Am The People, the new book, which discusses about right and left populism, but he does not discuss development populism of the sort that we find in Bangladesh type of countries. So that needs to be a little bit elaborated, thought about. And also to highlight the point of imperfect governance and imperfect democracy within which we live and we try to grow and try to develop. My main point is that the government is also learning. It's not that just the academics are learning. Government is also learning and it's learning by doing. It's not just the two pillars that is being mentioned by Professor Osmani, which is the avoidance of mortality and pursuit of growth. For instance, one of the problem of the reports is that it is restricted to the evidence of 2020. It does not uh, take into account the recent learnings and recent evidence, uh, particularly after the availability of vaccination. For instance, this year's budget the growth goal was not highlighted, not privileged. It was rather downplayed. Finance minister is on public saying that. And health and uh, vaccination availability, those issues have been prioritized. At least declaratively, I don't know how efficiently it will be translated into action. But my main point is that the government is also learning and first wave of COVID and the second and third wave of COVID will not be the same and the response would not be the same and the, and the meta philosophy guiding those responses would not be the same. same. The conclusion that there was an increase, in, temporary increase in poverty in 2020 is correct. But if we if we accept the thesis that in the last quarter, there was an economic recovery to the extent of 80% of the economy supported by many micro data sets, including enterprise level data sets, that would actually defy that conclusion that much of the increases in the nature of new poverty, maybe they are in the nature of transient poverty, it needs to be more researched. And I agree that these are the known unknowns, which Naomi was mentioning earlier, and, and that needs to be upfront recognized. I think report could do better if critically examined the life and livelihood paradigm from a dialectical point of view, because the interrelationship of, between the life and livelihood would change from stages of ac epidemics and, and so on. So in the first wave, the livelihood was prioritized. In the second, third wave, life is more prioritized. And, and I'm sure the, the combination, the mix will not remain 
unchanged over time. I can see that already it is happening in the government system by putting much effort uh, for getting vaccines from whatever sources are available and the distribution, even the world level distribution is promised and so on. I think more intractable problem is to how to devise a system for the vulnerable non-poor because there is no database for this type of people. And this is a genuine uh, epistemological problem and also a policy problem. So that needs to be also highlighted a bit more. I think uh, the more emphasis on universalizing health and universalizing social protection is the step in the right direction. And I support that this. An eight, five year plan actually makes a plea for uh, transition from 0.5% of GDP to 2.5% of GDP public health expenditure. But that's an indication of government self-learning and government's uh, indication in the medium term. Also, there is a lot of uh, current interest in universalizing, for instance, old age pension schemes in certain areas of the country. So you, you can see certain uh, shift is taking place. Lastly, I would say that uh, the report could have benefited by including a chapter on history of responses to pandemics and epidemics, because there is a vast literature uh, in the colonial and post-colonial era, and there can be a summary chapter on, on those, and Shahadud Zaman's name I saw in the list, he could have, uh, uh, he could have helped the uh, team in, in that respect. So I will stop. Great, thank you. Thank you, Vinagda. Uh, as usual, I think you raised a number of uh, areas of improvement and uh, provocation. Uh, uh, I don't know whether we'll have time to really get into some of these, but I think your point about you know, learning state, uh, the government is also learning, I think is something that is really important uh, for us to really unpack uh, and, and sort of critically look at. Um, you know, how fast, where, you know, where learning is happening, where there's active kind of more critical conversations we may need to engage with. But your point about framework, uh, more nuanced framework, I'm sure, you know, uh, Mirza Bhai can have a offline and separate conversation with you on that. Uh, great. Uh, I think really short of time, moving to uh, Dr. Razak, Dr. Amir Razak, uh, uh, is a research director at the Policy Research Institute, PRI, and also chairman of, uh, of RAPID uh, 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 Bangladesh. So he's going to be commenting on, um, on chapter seven. I mean, primarily the chapter that Professor Usmani uh, worked on in economic support um, and the quest for political legitimacy. Uh, uh, Razak, over to you. Imran, uh, thank you um, for inviting me uh, to be part of the panel. I really appreciate the opportunity. Now, at the outset, I must say the paper is really a thought-provoking one, an excellent uh, analysis of political legitimacy and how economic growth can be used. So hats off to Professor Esar Osmani. Now, I think in the paper, the three things, uh, for example, growth-oriented versus protection-oriented support measures, additionality of uh, allocation attributable to COVID-19 and utilization of you know, different packages, I think those will be extremely useful contribution to the policy discourse. Now, I don't have uh, any substantive comments on the chapter as such, but I would really like to make three points here. Number one, we know that the political economy factors have always been important in uh, making those uh, policy decisions. And in my view, have now become, in the context of Bangladesh, have now become more important than ever in providing policy support. For example, expanded, uh, 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 anyway, ideally, like if you consider the current situation, ideally, protection-oriented support measures uh, should have a strong political economy consideration and thus policy measures will be immensely popular. And I would think that, you know, expanded cash assistance program, for example, should be strongly pursued by the ruling, politi uh, ruling party politi uh, political leaders. Huh? 
But I think because of a weakened democratic process, I believe you know, this has compromised uh, the political economy weight of the social protection uh, oriented approach. And this could be one reason for the nature of support package you know, that we have seen in the context of Bangladesh you know, during the crisis. My second point is about uh, the discussion on economic growth. And this paper has pointed out uh, the significance of it in terms of providing political legitimacy. Now, along with growth, you all know, there are many other indicators you know, that are also being used. And our pla plan documents are replete with projections on like, you know, what Bangladesh should be achieving over the next five, 10 or 20 years you know, ahead. These target setting approach for growth and other socioeconomic indicators, which are sometimes called the so-called results-based or outcome-based economic management system, I think they, they can serve some good purpose, but you know, using these indicators, and we need to remember, you know, these are also statistical measurements and using them to establish political legitimacy have other consequences and we should be mindful of those. Economist Charles Goodhart, I believe in a paper in 1975, he mentioned that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And this has now uh, become, uh, uh, come to known as the Goodhart's law. And I think this is something so relevant and has transpired as such a big problem for Bangladesh. The overall economic growth performance, as you know, in Bangladesh has been a matter of you know, a debatable subject. And the associated statistical indicators, now they have also become problematic. Think about in the budget space, you know, the private investment figures that have been mentioned. There we can see virtually there is no impact of COVID-19 on private investment figures for 2019, 2020, and 2020, 2021, and so on. Then again, the, the problem here is during the COVID crisis, we have seen a modest growth rate of 5.24 percent, you know, relatively a strong growth rate. But again, according to some estimates, the poverty have gone up by 20 percentage points, as Professor Asmani has pointed out. How to reconcile this? You know, given the current quality of data that we have, we are not in a position to reconcile these uh, figures. Now, for the government, it considers Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics as the legitimate source of information. But we also know its capacity constraints. It did not provide much analysis or survey-based you know, undertaking during the COVID-19 period. And also we all need to be mindful of the fact that in the current context of Bangladesh, any unfavorable statistics that is either coming from the National Statistical Agency or for any other agency for that matter has been a remote possibility. Now, multilateral agencies, World Bank, IMF, IMF, we know, and ADP, they always come up with regular economic forecasting and updates, but with no robust projection exercise. And they have, over years, they have invested so little into the domestic independent facilities that could complement some of the official statistics that we get. So in a way, there is no way for us for fact-checking, you know, uh, 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 these numbers or, or, or the issues that are coming up. On the whole, I would say evidence-based analysis in a credible, meaningful, and timely manner has now thus become so difficult. My final point, Imran, I think this is important and has got some relevance uh, to the paper you know, uh, that, that we're discussing. Now, one thing is, um, somehow I do think that, you know, despite the thesis, you know, that, uh, that uh, Professor Usmani has uh, discussed, my view is this, we need to recognize the delivery challenge. And it is the delivery challenge associated with the social protection has also contributed to somewhat, you know, less emphasis that has been given to social protection measures. And there are three elements. There are three elements of these, you know, social uh, uh, protection related uh, uh, implementation challenges. One is the weak bureaucratic and administrative capacities that we have. And this is what, what we have seen in the context of identifying beneficiaries. This is not related to COVID-19 as such. This is a long standing issue. We have known about these targeting errors, uh, very large targeting errors. And our officials, they are aware of these you know, difficulties anyway. 
So that's one issue. Many poor were created in urban areas. Now, given the history of Bangladesh, Bangladesh does not have enough experience of providing social protection support to urban poor. So maybe in that context, perhaps uh, Dr. Binash then was referring to uh, some of the learning uh, that is uh, that being undertaken by the government. So that's the second issue. And the third point is here also, our finance ministers over many years, you know, they have religiously followed a budget deficit of around 5% of GDP. Right? Now, here's the problem. Once again, we need to be very mindful of this issue. Now, we can overestimate our GDP, but you see the deficit figures, that is quite real. So in a way, perhaps you know, we're already talking about a budget deficit, which is mu much higher than the 5% you know, benchmark you know, that the government would like to have. So there is a problem, like, you know, whether we can raise the deficit further. And then the issue is whether there is that technical capacity to raise and manage and maintain, you know, that high level of, you know, uh, fiscal deficit that would be because our tax GDP ratio is one of the lowest already. And that means, you know, undertaking a bold and, and crisis time policy intervention would be a risky venture for even for the administration. Now, I'll just take one more minute to conclude. The second element of delivery challenge is uh, the corruption. Although our bad record on corruption is well known, but many senior officials, as you, as you know, and policymakers would be reluctant about pursuing policies that could trigger further corrupt practices. If anecdotes would be of any help, I mean, I can tell you that there are many vacant posts, I mean, within, say, uh, the uh, in many different ministries that would be important during the COVID crisis mechanism. But we know that those posts are not being filled in just because in you know, the senior officials at the fact end of their careers don't want to take risk, you know, because these process can be quite, you know, corrupt in nature and there are a lot of, you know, issues. So even undertaking the recruitment would be a mammoth task. And also the lack of health spending that we have seen for uh, out of the additional budget you know that was given to the health ministry it could also be uh, uh, you know related to this particular you know if i can say fear factor as well finally i also say that in the absence of robust dem democratic practices and culture any critical evaluations are considered unwarranted right so like you know if the newspaper stories are there you know like you know government uh, uh, is providing uh, cash assistance to kind of you know, wrong people that will also have a different kind of an implications for a party in power uh, for the past 12 uh, or, or years or so. I think, I think less than 12, but I think around, around 10 years. Or so. so that will also need to be you know, taken into consideration. So on the whole, I would think, despite having our numerous plans and strategies, I mean, we have not been, Bangladesh has not done well in undertaking serious reforms. Okay? Now, bold reforms and difficult policy options have been sidelined in the context of Bangladesh. And it is so much so in the context of social protection policy, you see. As you can see, I mean, like, you know, the strategy that we have and the implementation so far, if you have seen the midterm review of the social protection policy, we are nowhere, you know, near to all the bold reforms we wanted to carry out. So I think my, my point is, therefore, even during the COVID crisis, you know, we have not been able to undertake bold measures. You know, we simply do not have the technical capacity, along with corruption and other problems. That we, I think I should stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Now, I I, I do have to. I think at this stage, let uh, but I really uh, 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 request that I think we will extend this by another fifteen minutes at least because uh, there are a few other speakers and we really want to listen and. Primarily, I mean, towards the end, we would like to give uh, some time to Professor Rahman Subhan to really provide some concluding thoughts. Uh, so I think I think uh, I would like to, at this stage, ex extend it by, by another 15 minutes, and we'll try and really finish it uh, within within that time period. Um, now, uh, our final discussant um, is uh, 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 Kalpuna Kalpuna Akhtar. Uh, she's a founding member and the executive director of Bangladesh Center for Workers Solidarity prominent labor rights activist and, uh, and a former child worker herself. Uh, and she campaigns vigorously for fair wages, uh, garment factory safety, and the right to form labor unions and, and, and collective bargaining. Uh, 
so uh, Kalpana Akhtar, uh, she's going to be commenting on uh, impact of COVID-19 on the RMG sector. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, Kalpana Akhtar, Appa, over to you. Thank you so much, Imran Bhai. Um, and Kalpana Akhtar is a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> that people say. Anyway, okay, so uh, congratulations for the support. And um, the chapter that you told me to comment to, uh, I had a you know chance to speak to Mahin Sultanapa during the research, and it is amazingly done. Thank you, Mahin Appa and Ifat. Um, I know both of them has been worked on this tirelessly. So um, I went through like how it has been said and uh, what is there and what is there, you know, what happened during the COVID. It has been told um, regarding lockdown. Uh, so I got all those, but I didn't see much about talk on the impact. Uh, what exactly impacted to the workers and you know the our government as well as our manufacturers proudly wanted to say how great they are uh, to have this industry and provide a job to these young women workers but um, they didn't tell that or, or they don't tell that how these women workers being impacted during uh, this COVID period so I just wanted to, you know, uh, enlighten that area, and I will be expecting that when this report is finalized, uh, it will be included. I mean, you can go through like more in-depth research, uh, or maybe speak to all those who lost job and how they are suffering. I mean, surviving now. So, no doubt, you know, uh, it was uh, soon this. Um, pandemic started, we have seen the irresponsible behavior from the brands and retailers, so do the manufacturers. I mean, both of these group who uh, prof made profit out of these workers for decades, they just dispose our workers by saying that uh, they don't have business now, they cannot sell their products, and our manufacturers started crying to get money from the, uh, menu, you know, the government uh, pocket to pay the workers. I mean, what a shame. It's a, it's a uh, three decade old industry. I mean, they love to say this is industry. And we, we wanted to believe it. Okay, three decades old industry cannot pay workers for their one month wages. It's really shame. So what it has been done, uh, they started firing the workers from the factories, even they got the stimulation package. It is few hundred thousand workers who lost their jobs and they went back to ground zero in an empty hand because they had not paid their severances money by saying that they didn't work more than uh, one, one year in the factory. But no one has been thought about that what would be happen to these workers or these women with their children when they go back to the ground zero. They started facing domestic violence because they were exposed more to their partners. In many cases, their partners also lost their job. So they ended up them in a hunger. Situation you cannot even believe. Like we, the manufacturers, and we have also seen that there is a 12% uh, shortage of workers in the industry. That was the situation before COVID. And after COVID, it came that you can find 100 or 200 workers waiting in front of every factory to get hired. And out of 200, maybe two gets hired. And women are crying and saying that I left my two baby at home in disturbing and there is no one to care about them. And I'm looking for jobs. And she's not doing that for one month. It is for a few months. She constantly doing that. And our government love to say there is a social protection for our workers uh, when they have got some donation from the European Union. They did not even pay one, one, one taka from their pocket to protect these workers through that so-called social protection. Why these workers are not included in that social protection? I mean, even if you name it social protection, why they did not get money out of that? Why this list not been shared to uh, the labor ministry? Because there is not system developed. They're more uh, dependent on the manufacturers to provide the list rather using DIFI, which is an inspection department or DOL to get the list. So the money is still unused and our workers are facing hungry. Um, 
there is an increase of uh, you know gender-based violence. It has been enormously increased in the factories now these days. Uh, is you know because when you have a poverty, you need to face all these. So and when you have poverty, the first hit is women and then children. So our women are facing all those. This is like severe job insecurity they have. I had you know many more meetings with the workers and especially the women workers. Um, you know, in the last couple of months. And every time when we list that, what is your priority now? Everyone said, to save my job. I cannot afford to lose my job now. So any cause, they are, you know, saving their job at this moment, even facing gender-based violence, even facing, uh, you know, ir irregular payment, even facing, uh, there is a huge, uh, you know, uh, wage gap in bit before and after COVID. The wage gap is 30 to 35 percent, and no one there to you know attend all those issues. Not our government, not manufacturers, and let alone the brands who are you know trying to pay even less price during this time. So, and why we are facing all this? Of course, there is a power imbalance. There is a power collusion. It has been wrote in the paper, and I'm telling too, that maybe, you know, many of our powerful ministers who own group of government factories, so whom you can fight with. When we talk about that our workers are, you know, still in a hunger with their children when they have full payment, how you can give 65% to them? And whom we are talking to? With our minister, who are equally the factory owners too. So our voice never been heard. I mean, it is a long, you know, problem that we are being facing. So, you know, I don't want you to go through like all these problems, like one to one, but I wanted to uh, recommend some of these, uh, you know, with with uh, with the recommendation phase. That one definitely, the our workers should get vaccinated, and they should be considered as a frontliner along with other. I do respect. The labor rights group do respect the, you know, all the administration people who are working in the front line, doctors, everyone. But I do have huge respect for our workers who are working in the front line, in the factory, in other industry, even the transport workers. So those should get should get vaccinated. The workers should equally get risk benefit when you consider for administrative people, bankers. The workers also should get the risk benefit. There should not be any more firing. We have had enough. It is over a few hundred thousand workers lost their job and they couldn't come back to the industry yet. We need a few more time. So the, you know, the firing should be stopped. There should be wage gap incentive. If you talk to the women, the first thing they tell us, you know, due to the wage gap, what they have been done, they cut their meals, even for their children. And you know they they cut the portion in the in their menu as well, like no meat for months, fish maybe you know uh, once in every two months. And how did they do that? They walk for two hours to their factory, save their transport money, and buy some fish for their girls or boys or children. That is the reality now. So an incentive for waste gap is really really needed. Social protection and the you know unemployment insurance. When we talk about unemployment insurance, I wanted to give this burden to three uh, group, the government, the manufacturers, and so do the, you know, uh, the brand and retailers. They should contribute on that. But for Bangladeshis, for workers, we have, um, if I'm not wrong, it is like 16 million people we have who, who are the workers, or it is more than that, sorry. So my point is that everyone should be get under the social protection. Me, I need a social protection in here. So the voice should not be come from the worker rights group only. It should be come from every, every, every single person in the country. And when we workers, I mean, it's not a recommendation. We just you know, share with everyone that when we workers are fighting for our rights, let not just fight us for us, okay? give your voice to like civil society, the other other movements like feminist movement, the um, uh, environmental movements, everyone can fight together and we can, you know, uh, get our rights. And I I wanted to finish with when um, Binayagda was saying that our government is learning, I wish we could learn more, okay? Um, it is 16 months of lockdown now, 16 months of pandemic. We really had a great hope that the government will have some share 
uh, or some portion in our budget for workers, but they failed us. There is no hope for our workers. So literally, uh, government did not learn anything. They, they need to learn more and that need to be faster. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Thank Imran you. Bhai. Thank you. Thank you so much, Palguna. Uh, 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 I think you raised some excellent points and I think, uh, yeah, I mean this, 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 this. Uh, you know, the, the point about building kind of coalition uh, for for a larger movement, I think, is is sort of absolutely uh, critical and and social protection, including uh, including uh, enlarging the social protection. And it's the point that we have also made in terms of a more universalist approach towards social protection, a more generous social protection, a more rights oriented approach to social protection. I think these are some of the things that we also have. Uh, talked about in in the in the report in terms of some of the mid to long term uh, agenda that we definitely need to pursue in a in, in very very urgently. Great. Now uh, uh, I would now like to invite um, Professor Rahman Subhan um, uh, to really you know kind of uh, try and pull some threads together and help us move forward perhaps in terms of in terms of uh, you know finalizing the report or thinking about some future research that we may want to do. Uh, so Professor Rahman Subhan, uh, you know, needs no introduction, but founder and chairman of Center for Policy Dialogue. Um, uh, that's that's what I have written here, but uh, but I think uh, that's a very uh, narrow description of Professor Rahman Subhan. So sir, over to you. I'm giving you 15 minutes, but if you could maybe finish in 13 minutes and give me two minutes to conclude, that would be really well. Thank you, sir. 13 is an unlucky number. So I'll give you, sir, then 14 minutes. Is that is that a better number? <laughs> that, that may work better. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you, Imran. Uh, uh, to begin with, uh, let me commend uh, BIGD, you, Imran, and particularly the lead authors, uh, Mirza and Naomi and their colleagues for really quite an exceptionally good work and to bring Usmani into this with that extraordinary chapter uh, with great analytical depth, uh, I think is a major achievement. Uh, there's been a lot of chit chat on uh, issues of political economy. Uh, some of it is included into the discussion on COVID, but uh, this is the first attempt to really put all this together and to apply the discipline of political economy to address uh, the course of the crisis in the way it has been tackled and the sort of problems which have emerged and what needs to be done about it. Uh, my immediate suggestion would be that uh, because of the quality of the work, it merits presentation in some of the uh, better uh, academic institutions in, internationally, where perhaps you should uh, see if you could um, share this work with those who have done similar exercises, if such have been done, on uh, the political economy of responding to COVID in other countries, uh, India, for example. Uh, because big issues of political relevance uh, in terms of the way in which uh, the Modi regime has handled it are uh, going on in India. But what I would be particularly interested in, I think I've been talking to Akhtar Mahmood, for example, about this, is a meaningful comparison of what were the specific uh, governance features in the Viet Vietnamese state, which enabled them to so effectively uh, cope with COVID and to do all the things which we should have been doing but could not do. Uh, purely, I mean, we know, of course, but there are two very different systems, but merely to, in fact, uh, put them side by side and to see what are the critical governance variables to determine uh, the outcomes uh, is, I think, will be particularly useful. So uh, this would be my uh, suggestion for some of the way in which you really project this work uh, not just domestically, but internationally. Now, one uh, specific point, which I had briefly pointed out in the uh, pre-meeting discussion, is that uh, your survey work that you have done, I mean, for example, the work uh, you did in chapter two 
on uh, getting responses to the way in which the COVID was being handled. Um, these, to some extent, the uh, positive responses of the people who have uh, been involved in your questionnaire is somewhat at variance uh, with the general direction of your, uh, both, both the evidence you've presented and the analysis that you, to which you've exposed itself. Now, this I think needs to be looked at. Uh, I think, of course, part of the problem may well be that you did your surveys uh, sometime, uh, you were telling me, early in January, which was the peak time when uh, the AstraZeneca vaccines had just come in. We were all getting uh, applauded. The government was being applauded for the excellent way in which it had handled vaccine procurement and vaccinations. And then all this process fell apart. And then we've had the second wave of the crisis and the Delta COVID come in. So it would be interesting to see if those perspectives hold good uh, in July as distinct from January. But of course, more also to, relevant to this would be the question of whether you have also asked the right questions, uh, right meaning sufficiently focused questions to capture not just a bit of information, but something which would give you some analytical purchase in order to address the political economy issues which you've been analyzing. I find that a lot of the survey research which is done like this is to, in that sense, sort of tends to be sort of two, uh, one dimensional and really lacks analytical depth, uh, which uh, fails to, bring in the nuances of the discipline that you are really pursuing. Now, the fact that you are attempting to do this, I think is commendable. So if you want to carry this on, then you should keep this in mind in the way in which you design your surveys. Now, there were the key set of points made uh, in the original presentation by uh, Mirza and Naomi, uh, conceptualized in chapter two, on the whole issue of uh, performance. And uh, Usmani, of course, then uh, uh, termed this as uh, uh, growth. Now, I think there will be some need for the uh, authors in general and Usmani to in fact reconcile whether they are both on the same page when they are using the term performance indicators and growth indicators, because Usmani has a very specific uh, uh, idea in mind of growth. And in fact, he uses this when he is exposing it to analysis in terms of the way in which resources have been allocated. But of course, performance is a sort of slightly wider concept than growth, and it would in the any meaningful sense of the term, if a government wants to be measured by its performance, would not just be looking at GDP growth rates, but would presumably also be wanting to take pride in uh, its impact on poverty reduction, on the way in which uh, health indicators have improved, and other related uh, welfare indicators have shown signs of improvement. And of course, this is a great talking point of the government of how, in fact, rapidly poverty has been reduced. So when we set out to do this analysis and we say that the government is essentially uh, chosen to be measured, not by its, uh, you may say, its sort of electoral and uh, democratic accountability, but by performance accountability, then we should be very clear about what we are comparing over here. Now, of course, if you use the wider metric of performance, then uh, merely demonstrating that you are giving stimulus packages to uh, the growth producing sectors, but you are in fact neglecting the uh, uh, welfare outcomes, which are impacting on poverty, quality of healthcare, the way in which COVID is being addressed, is of course a very serious problem because this becomes a major performance failure. And the question of seeking performance legitimacy merely by demonstrating that your 
growth rate has been increasing or that you are maintaining some level of export growth is an insufficient metric. And the government, which in fact wants to look for its look, look to its uh, political future, would need to sort of broaden it. And I think the government does seek to broaden its achievements uh, in terms of performance legitimacy by incorporating these ideas. So here there are clear evidence of performance uh, uh, deficiencies over here. Now, Usmani's uh, breakdown of the data. Uh, for government and public allocations uh, to address these uh, two indicators is quite remarkable, very impressive. I mean, he gives the allocations which have been made. He makes the clear distinction between the resources uh, which are being programmed through the banking system and the resources which are being programmed through the budget. And if you then uh, simply focus on the budget area, which is specific to the government, uh, which uh, the role of the government itself, uh, then the uh, allocative performance of the government uh, comes down extremely low. And it's beyond understanding, in fact, as to why, uh, in fact, uh, allocations should be at such a low level. I mean, it isn't even considered. I mean, assuming that there is a quest for performance legitimacy, uh, this, this sort of allocation doesn't make sense at all. I would therefore uh, request uh, both uh, Usmani and um, Mirza and Naomi to perhaps look at another form of logic. That after all, if you look at the way in which uh, resources have been channeled, particularly to RMG and then to big business, through the banking mechanism. This is more a reflection, uh, not of the government seeking uh, uh, growth legitimacy, but mere a reflection of the political economy of the state. That here are the people who are key decision makers, and they are the ones who are being, uh, made the principal allocative beneficiaries of resources being channeled to address COVID. So, this is a reflective reflection of their political and allocative power within the nature of the state as exists in Bangladesh today. Now, it's interesting that uh, the banking mechanism has been used to, in fact, channel resources, and that most of it, as we have seen, has gone to the uh, big business sector. Now, what is going to follow as night follows day is that this is going to Com contribute to a further crisis, which is an aggravation of the default crisis, which was already endemic before the pandemic. And the fact that you are now channeling resources, which are then backed up by considerable rescheduling, will of course indicate that the problems which the banks are going to face are going to be then be further aggravated and further perpetuated. Now, this is entirely in conformity with the preferences of the uh, uh, business elite and the way in which they influence decisions and regulations. So I think uh, a relevant problem should therefore be, it isn't that you are driven by uh, growth indicators, you're simply driven by the uh, distribution of power and the political economy which underlies decision-making. I think this would be a issue which is worth examining. Now, uh, how much time do I have, Imran? Uh, anyway, uh, now let me uh, just say a few more words over here. Uh, what is quite significant over here is that um, the causal outcomes, uh, the outcomes of the interventions which have taken place, are always inadequately addressed. I mean, we have observed and we have pointed out to successive finance ministers over many years that actually when you present your budget, you should kindly demonstrate the outcomes of the uh, decisions, uh, the uh, fiscal and institutional decisions you made in the previous budget. But what you never have is any evaluation of outcomes of state performance uh, so that it can serve as a guidance 
for what might be done better in the next budget or the next decision-making cycle. Now here, for example, if we are channeling 70% uh, of credit resources, uh, not to the big business sector, what have been the outcomes of this? Now we have heard uh, Kalpana indicating the wretched conditions uh, which are afflicting the workers. Uh, presumably the underlying uh, logic which was made by the uh, government industry owners was that this is also going to be beneficial to workers. But of course, if there has been both a contraction of employment, uh, reduction in wage rates, uh, increases in unemployment, how much of it has actually gone in to drive uh, business expansion remains open to question. In fact, we were told in some places that quite a bit of this uh, uh, lending is gone to also sort of retire old debt or God alone knows where else it might have gone. But unless we have rig rigorously evaluated how each of the recipients of the uh, incentive package have actually utilized this for growth promoting, uh, uh, growth pr promoting actions is again a moot question. We are simply assuming in Usmani and his analysis is simply hypothesizing that this is growth inducing, but actually there is no uh, concrete evidence of any sort, whether from the business sector or the research community as to whether this actually done so. And now here, uh, the f final point that I would want to come on to, uh, relates then to the policy recommendations. Now, uh, prem uh, the premise of a lot of the analysis uh, made was the whole concept a weak state, strong society. What was insufficiently uh, spelled out is what we understand by a strong society and uh, what we imply by a weak state. Uh, strong society can mean many things. I mean, normally it means that various uh, factions of society have got autonomous and independent power for in fact, actually the way in which they uh, react to state policy. Now, whether this is the case or whether uh, there is a strong element of societal anarchy in which uh, there is a tendency to sort of disobey the state and to then sort of only uh, never observe lockdowns or to do it insufficiently and to in fact actually conduct ourselves in ways which are personally convenient to us needs to be investigated. Correspondingly, you need to look at the whole concept of the strong or weak state. Now, Ronak Jahan had of course pointed out and challenged the question about uh, the dominance of a political party. Well, of course, a political party is uh, exclusively dominant and in fact is holding uh, political power with very weak electoral legitimacy. But they have pointed out, as Ronak has observed, that they actually do in reality exercise very limited power. That in effectively in terms of uh, state policy making, it is made exclusively at the top and implementation is largely left to the bureaucracy. So what we are really talking about is an ex not a prime ministerial parliamentary system, but a de facto executive presidency with a strong president with absolute powers operating largely through the state bureaucracy as well as the uh, coercive agencies of the state and the uh, intelligence agencies of the state as their main agents of governance. Now, in those circumstances, the uh, political players are essentially reduced to the role of patronage uh, distribution, rent extraction, and in fact, actually utilizing what limited power they have uh, to participate in uh, business activities and to uh, evolve themselves into businessmen. If you, in fact, actually look at the composition of parliament itself, but not just parliament, look at the uh, Upozela uh, 
composition, the Upazesha comes in, even the uh, uh, union Polisha, a high percentage of people will be out there bidding for contracts, participating in infrastructure, construction work, and all the rest of it, and really uh, competing in, unequally in the marketplace, or serious market distortions are being permitted because of the way in which this political power is now being ex exclusively exercised in the quest for making money in accumulation. And in fact, uh, compete, taking over, monopolizing not just access to state resources, but also in uh, creating uh, distortions in the marketplace, where rather than competitive forces being allowed to play, uh, issues of crony capitalism become a significant factor. So the last point I would then make to you over here is that when you start talking about policy recommendations, then uh, what you have done over here, and I think here's where you need you up your game a bit and to go back to the original uh, purpose of the report, which is to address issues of political economy. There is no great demonstration of the political economy dimensions of your policy recommendations. Because if you were to address these issues, then the real questions you should be answering are what are the factors which are contributing to the weak state? Why, why even though bureaucracy is being utilized so intensively, why are they then so incapable of actually doing the sort of things that they're expected to do? Why were they not? Why was their performance in procurement so weak? Why have they not been able to spend the budgets in the health sector? These are the relevant questions which need to be answered. Correspondingly, when you are wanting to address problems of transparency and reduction of corruption, you need to be, again, addressing the dynamics of these processes of the lack of transparency, the lack of corrupt, lack of uh, the oversight of the corruption process, the uh, constant attempts to, in fact, resist elements of uh, imposing uh, of realizing transparency through the media and through other civil society initiatives, the strong resistance to this and how this problem can be actually addressed because merely by saying that we should in fact have uh, greater transparency and we should address problems of corruption to address uh, both uh, targeting and uh, and to understand why this is going on. This is a political economy issue, the whys of that, which you have addressed in your report, but you have not then gone on to adequately address in addressing the major interventions which would look at the roots of this problem. Finally, of course, I would say over here that uh, the big problems which we face are that the COVID crisis, because of the weak way in which it has been handled and the lack of any policy direction or clarity is really with us today. And here we have a situation where you thought you were on top of the crisis in January, and now you are faced with an upward curve, which is showing no signs at all of flattening out uh, because really there is no capacity or no policy uh, in place to enable you to actually address these problems. Now, this essentially means, because what we have learned from every, uh, the success stories of China and Vietnam, is that unless you really get a handle on the COVID, you can ensure that you flatten the curve and then you then uh, bring it downwards and you keep it going downwards. And you have then put in place the capacities to ensure that uh, you will address then the uh, uh, you will address then the shocks to the system. Uh, this will be a question which you will need to address over here. That how do you now, in real terms, deal with this problem? That we have not solved it. We have no effective solution to solving this. And what will then be the implications? of sustaining growth, because unless you can go back more or less full time, 
to uh, pursuing growth in even in the government sense of the term of getting your factories all working at full strength, getting the farm economy there, getting the trading sector working at full force, getting the uh, migrants going back to work, uh, you are really not going to solve the problem. So right. a false dichotomy has been put in place over here between, uh, you may say, lives and livelihoods. Uh, we need to really resolve this. And why this has not been addressed may itself be one of the central questions which you need to address within the framework of your study. So congratulations for an excellent work. Uh, I make all these remarks in the way of ideas for value addition, because obviously uh, what you have done is not the last word. You may improve on this if you uh, have taken ideas from the comments, but more to the point, you can go on working on this because there is much more work to be done. And we hope that you can address some of the issues which are raised in the discussion today. Again, thank you for inviting me. And uh, again, my profound congratulations for the work well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, 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 I'll just take a minute, uh, you know, just to talk. I don't know whether uh, Mirza Bhai uh, or Naomi, do you want to, do you want, is there anything you want to basically say? Maybe a minute, two minutes. We are anyway, you know, well, well past the time. So why not? Uh, I don't know, Mirza Bhai or Naomi, anyone? I just want to say thank you for all of the really, really brilliant discussants. There were so many good points there that I, I really think, you know, I want to take it up that Ms. Avai and I and the rest of the team would, would really like to. Just very, very much listening and learning a lot. Thank you so much. Great. And uh, and, uh, uh, Imran, uh, just uh, 30 seconds. Right. So please remember that Bangladesh is one of the three, four economies of the world that has exhibited positive growth rate in the 2020. And, 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 and that, is, that is to be appreciated. So the tone of the report should not be, but I, I find a certain incongruence you know, by not recognizing that part. And secondly, Wonder, really growth is not before. just one of the major concerns that the government had probably is to provide social protection through employment. That has to be also somehow uh, be taken in. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benagda. Uh, uh, Ms. Zawai, do you want to come in? Uh, yes. Uh, um, like uh, Naomi, I would like to thank you everyone. I really, really appreciate, not in token sense because we're going to uh, use your feedback, all the brilliant observation that you've made uh, to revise the, the, SOG, the SOG reports. Uh, but this is a report, this is not a heavy duty academic work. So a lot of critical stuff cannot be accommodated, uh, we would like to, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do that in probably in, uh, in journal articles and, and uh, subsequent books and so on. Just one point. Uh, Binayagda was saying that, you know, the state is of learning. One example that Professor Ronald Jan was giving is uh, that um, the political elite, the top political elites probably have learned that they need to, they need to somehow um, uh, ring fence the, the political machine at the local level so there can be integrity in the service delivery. And that's why they are banking on the bureaucracy. Uh, rather than the, the rather than the political machines, the patronage machines, and that's I mean, how do you look at it? I mean, it is not good for democracy, but it may be good for developmental state. So you know, this is the I mean, how do you look at it? Uh, you will evaluate it. Okay, uh, so that's the point. So these these are the learning that we'll probably try to bring in more analytically in our revised report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And now uh, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a real pleasure for me to, you know, kind of conclude. Thank all of you for a really rich, uh, uh, I think, discussion and great inputs. Uh, as Naomi and uh, Mirza Bhai said, uh, you know, I think we are, we are going to, you know, you know, take all of this. There have been really rich comments also in the chat box. Uh, which some we responded, but mo many we could not respond. These will we will take them on board and look at them. But I think most importantly, you know, this 
state of governance is not like previous state of government uh, governance reports that we have done in the sense that we are dealing with a evolving mm -hmm. you know a, a sort of evolving storyline and mm -hmm. and that's exactly why we're not we're going to keep it a bit live uh, we what we have produced is a, a research brief which we have made public and is available. But the draft report we're going to do some more work based on the comments. But actually, may actually do some more re some more uh, uh, research work, primary research work, secondary uh, 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 data reviews for the next two three months. Uh, uh, it mm -hmm. could include even doing a repeat of the survey that was done mm -hmm. uh, as a panel and maybe more improved questions. So, you know, this engagement with you is not the end of it. We are going to come back to most of the discussions to really understand your comments more, but also to help us uh, to really weave this, uh, uh, this evolving story so that we can actually, you know, you know, sort of come up with sort of, you know, you know, kind of, you know, findings, insights and frameworks through which we can really uh, 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 sort of understand what, what, what has been happening and primarily, how do we re really get to, I think, what Mirza and others are talking about, this anti-fragile uh, uh, you know, institutions of governance? And how do we move from a performance legitimacy that is based on growth, primarily, to human development, which has been historically you know, the kind of the premise of uh, this particular uh, sort of government's legitimacy, historically? So uh, this particular political party legitimacy. So how do we really get to that uh, 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 that level of equilibrium, and how do we get from a proving oriented uh, performance legitimacy to a more improving oriented performance legitimacy? And I think those are uh, going to be the main uh, kind of critical questions that we need to grapple with. So thank you very much for this uh, really uh, rich conversation. Uh, we're really all enriched uh, by 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 all your. Uh, 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 contributions, but as I said, uh, you know, we will be getting back to you and you are, we're now, you know, in many ways co-opting you as a part of this, uh, this research, ongoing research that we're going to do uh, over the next few months and, and, and trying to complete it. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.